on Monday, there, there was definitely a leak of hydrogen. Now, it was quite slow, and, it, and they thought maybe it actually had to do with temperature sensors being regulated and affecting the flow rate, essentially, because this liquid oxygen and hydrogen needs to be kept super cold. Mm. So the solution after the failed launch on Monday was, all right, if we slow fill the rocket, that probably will solve the problem. So they allowed a longer time to fill the fuel, um, and they started that, um, you know, last night our time and it seemingly was going well they then started to run a bit out of time as in time was creeping up it wasn't slowing as fast and they only had to do this process manually so essentially in order to account for this slow fuel they had to do it manually now at a few points they ran over pressure only for a few seconds mm -hmm. um and there was worried maybe that damaged the seals it, the data will say if that's the case or not. They then went to the full kind of fast fuel, the normal flu rate, fl mm. flow rate. At that time, that's when they started to see this leak way bigger, way, way, way more massive than anything they saw on Monday. And it became very apparent very quickly that that launch wasn't going to happen. So I guess it's good that they were able to spot this before the rocket actually launched. Now, I read somewhere too that the next possible window would be Monday or Tuesday. What happens if, if they fail a third time? So I think now the launch Monday is definitely off after the press conference. NASA is quite clear that they're going to have to spend more time on this problem. And as you mm. said, that was the third window that's going to pass. So that means the next possible launch is the end of September. Now, it's going to be tricky whether they can reach that or not, because one of the problems they have is in the early October, the SpaceX Crew-5 mission is supposed to take off essentially from there as well. Mm. So they can't really have these two rockets there at the same time. So it's likely that it's actually going to slip to mid-October. And this will all depend on how long the fix is, whether they can fix it at the launch pad or they need to wheel it back to the vehicle assembly building. Now, there's pros and cons, as they talked about, to both. It's quicker to do it at the launch pad, but there's things they can't do at the launch pad, but they mm. can do in the vehicle assembly building and vice versa. Weather always comes into play, leaving the rocket out, mm. and whether the permissions of, of the launch facility will allow them to stay out there. So over the course of the week, they have to work through what was the exact problem, what are all the things they need to fix. Mm. It does appear to be this valve and essentially the covering and seal of the valve, but whether it's a quicker few week fix on the launch pad or a month to six week fix back at the vehicle assembly building and roll it back still remains to be uncertain. Clearly, it's not going to happen probably until October. I think it's safe to budget that in at this point. Am I right to presume that with every delay, it just gets more costlier? <laughs> Every time they fill that rocket up, it takes money. And one of the problems you actually have is you can't leave the fuel in the tanks. Um, it, it's rocket fuel. You don't want to leave a very combustible thing leaking and potentially causing problems. So every time they fill it up and don't launch, they have to unfuel. This takes money. This takes effort people, time, work. Now, you know, the scale of it is small giving to the entire project cost, but the more delays they have and the more times they go through this, the more times that adds to the budget. Now, you know, this was always supposed to be a test flight. So the positive side is to say is, as you were saying earlier, they can detect these problems, they can try and solve these problems and work around these problems. But then you get into the reality of the situation, this rocket needs to launch at some point and it needs to be successful because otherwise you can't launch the second one, which will have humans and you can't launch the third one, which will land humans on the moon. And all of those then become uncertain and delayed. So they really have to get this one right and kind of the backs are against the wall to solve these problems. OK, this particular rocket, Artemis 1, is uncrewed. Um, and, and let's just say that they do get through all the other launches and they finally are able to land humans on the moon. The ultimate aim of that mission is to learn more about the moon. What more do we need to know about the moon? I, I presumed that we already knew everything about the moon. Well, yeah, that's interesting because I think the biggest legacy of the Apollo was was not landing humans. Like that was obviously important, yeah. but we changed our view of the moon in terms of its composition, how it was formed, 
Uh, it was drifting away, its interaction with the Earth, all so many things. Now the goal is to learn about the moon, to actually use the moon itself as a way to get to Mars. Mm. So the whole goal here is really to say how much ice and what are the quantities of stuff that we can use on the surface and how do we start setting that up to get humans to Mars? Because the idea is it will be a lot easier to leave the moon to Mars because there's a lot less gravity. There's still gravity on the moon, just a lot less. That means you need a lot less fuel. The existence of ice, which is H2O, hydrogen and oxygen, is the exact same fuel they're using in this rocket, which means now you have the fuel to go to Mars. So that's kind of the name of the game, but they have to do the work on the ground, they have to build it up. You know, this is looking at Artemis IV after they land humans there to start assembling the space station around the moon and really using the moon as we do now low Earth orbit with their National Space Station is, and that is our activity in space as we look towards Mars and even further. But it's also, you know, they're not the only game in town. And I think this is the difference back in the 60s. It was the US and Russia. Now China, Russia, the US, plus private companies like SpaceX are all developing their own infrastructure, their own rockets, their own ways to get there. So it's it's no longer they're just the only game in town. In mm-hmm. fact, there's multiple horses in this race, yeah. all gunning to do as much or more than NASA. 